So I'm going to start with uh, a story um, from my son, because I'm a firm believer that most life's great lessons are learned either as a kid or from kids. So a couple years ago, uh, we were at a beach, and we were talking with a friend who was making crafts at the beach, and our son said, you know, he, he got to, to talking with the guy, and he looked up at my husband and I and said, you know what? Um, how come this guy makes a couple hundred dollars a year and yet you just bought a $2,000 ukulele? And I looked at my husband and said, whoa, uh, I didn't expect this this soon. And we thought about how to respond. And we said, you know how we always tell people that we're all equal? Well, the truth of it is that uh, life's not fair and we aren't. And so my son thought about it and he said, I get it. So we may not always be equal, but we should treat people equally. And that stuck with me. Um, and if you think about the greatest leaps in humanity, it's when we've been able to treat everyone equally. And so we think about it in health. And we look at life expectancy over time. And it's incredible, because we are in a time of exponential advancement. And in fact, in the last 100 years, we've doubled our life expectancy. And it's been because we have been able to make advancements that touch everyone. So sanitation and access to vaccines. The crazy part is, is that for the first time in almost 100 years, we are declining in life expectancy in, here in the US. So uh, for the past two years, we're declining. And if for this year we decline, it'll be the first time in 100 years since the Spanish flu that this has happened. So what's causing it? Well. Back then, it was infectious diseases like the Spanish flu. Today, it's chronic diseases. So over 50% of adults in the world suffer from chronic diseases, and these account for over 70% of deaths now and over 80% of health expenditures. Uh, this is the crisis of today. Alzheimer's disease. You know, this is now the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. This is over a $1 trillion problem, and the staggering fact is one out of two of us will have it over age 85. It is also 100% fatal. And right now, there's no cure or disease-modifying treatment out there. So, is this a rich world problem? No, it's not. In fact, it affects everyone. Um, chronic diseases now um, are all over the globe. So, China four-fifths of the people are dying from chronic disease. In fact, the only continent that's at the tipping point is Africa. And even in sub-Saharan Africa, that is changing. In 2010, measles was the sixth leading cause of death. And today, it's number 33 on the list. So this is a, a global problem, as these diseases really don't discriminate. And if you look at the state of drug innovation today, you find that the drugs are naturally focused on chronic diseases. So of the top 10, all 10 are focused on chronic diseases. And an interesting thing about this is that eight of the top 10 now are biologics. So these are like proteins, antibodies. And in fact, the average price of a new monoclonal antibody is about $96,000 a year. We have massive advancements in drugs. So we got enzyme replacement therapies, CAR-T, gene therapies, and these are fantastic for patients. But these are even more expensive. These are hundreds of thousand dollars, even a million dollars per patient. So that's you know, multiple times the cost of a house in a developing world country. And if you look at this and you think about it, how does this compare to GDP of countries? Of, and what you see is that it can't. Now, of course, there are people that can afford this, you know, privately, through insurance, but the point to take home is the vast majority of people will not have access to these medicines. And if you look at Alzheimer's just by itself, you can see that the diseases do not discriminate. In fact, Asia is probably the, the place where Alzheimer's is the most prevalent. Let's take a look at the healthcare spend. And naturally, North America and EU are the highest. And if we just took, let's say, half the price of the average monoclonal out there and we multiplied it by Alzheimer's, how would that, han that, how would that be handled within the countries? And even in countries like the United States and Canada, it would bankrupt our system. I mean, Southeast Asia, South Asia, they can't even think about this. So if you look back in history, we find that history actually isn't linear. It's recursive. It repeats itself. So one of the places for inspiration to say, how have we 
you know, overcome epidemics in the past. And so I don't know how many people of you know this, but this is a picture of the iron lungs. So 70 years ago, polio was the, the disease of the day, and everyone was frightened to death. In fact, you know, whole towns closed down in the summertime. Um, and so these are pictures of iron lungs, and this is the state-of-the-art treatment of the day. They cost about 1,500 bucks, which at the time was about the, the cost of a house. And if you got acute polio, this was the treatment. So every day, you know, these iron lungs would help you breathe. And this is actually a neighbor, Paul, who lives in our town in Dallas, and he has been in an iron lung every day for the last 65 years. Now, Einstein said, smart people solve problems, geniuses prevent them. And so polio was being treated with these iron lungs, distributed everywhere until a man named Jonas Salk came around and provided the polio vaccine. The irony is that virologists of the day uh, were all against it. You know, he actually had to test it on his own family first and confirm it before he would go into massive clinical trials. And when he offered it out, it became the largest volunteer experiment in history up to that point. I think over a million people came out and participated in this. And as a result, today, polio is, is practically eradicated. Now, the amazing thing is that it wasn't just in this country. Today, over 80% of people in the world are vaccinated. That is six billion people and there are over 20 diseases that are now preventable through vaccination. The thing is, vaccines are highly effective against infectious diseases. But what about chronic diseases? What about the problems of today? We've immunosculpted you know, children now, so from the age of one to 10, we've immunosculpted, we've trained these bodies uh, to prevent and fight infectious diseases, and that's how we've doubled life expectancy. What about can we do it for older people as well? It turns out that some already do. So do you remember that stat that one in two people have Alzheimer's after over 85? Well, the fact is that one in two also don't. So what's different about them? It turns out that researchers, you know, who study high-performing cohorts of centenarians, find out that when they look in the blood and spin it down, these people are somehow auto-vaccinating themselves against toxic proteins in the brain. So the trick is, can we get other people to do this? Can we teach bodies to somehow protect themselves, generate antibodies to protect themselves from these pathologic proteins in the brain? It turns out, so just bear with me as I digress for a second, uh, the root of this vaccine revolution, I believe, is going to be here, in Bortaint. So Bortaint, how many people know what Bortaint is? Raise your hand. OK. Uh, <laughs> Bortaint, if you eat pork, it comes either from a female pig or a castrated male pig. And the reason is because if you have an uncastrated male pig, there's this taint that men don't like. Women, we don't notice it. But men, we, they can't stand it. So any commercially farmed pig is either female or castrated. And so the industry came to us for animal welfare reasons, and there's a lot of... Um, side effects of castrating pigs and said, can you find an immunological solution for this? And so sure enough, our team of the parent company uh, developing a vaccine technology decided to give this a try. And lo and behold, two shots and the balls disappear. <laughs> a side note is that this vaccine was actually invented by my mother. So you talk about parents who scare dates away. My mother invented a vaccine that cuts balls. <laughs> so why does this matter? It turns out that doing this is actually really difficult. And in fact, only one, there are only four vaccines in the world that are currently approved against an endogenous target. Well, why is that? It's because our bodies are smart. Nature is smart. We don't like to fight ourselves. Chronic diseases, hormones, this is our body in action. In fact, we're trained you know, throughout life not to attack ourselves. If we do, it's autoimmune disease. So this just proved up the concept. And in fact, we kept proving it up, and we developed other vaccines for animal health. And now we've vaccinated about a quarter of the world's pigs. And in the past less than a decade, we've uh, sold over 4 billion doses. Um, and the, 
The best part is, is that we can do this at just dollars a dose. So now let's translate to Alzheimer's. Or, and we think, what would it take to develop a vaccine for Alzheimer's? Well, it turns out that people have tried. In fact, 10 years ago, there was a great uh, vaccine by Elan, and uh, it was very promising, but unfortunately, they had problems with the vaccine technology because, like I was saying, the body doesn't like to fight itself. And so traditional vaccine technology is either you don't get a response, or the response that you get isn't very good, or if you, you know, try to rile up the immune system, you get side effects, and most of it's off target. It turned out that most of it was off target and people started dying from meningencephalitis. So here our company is, you know, we're a bunch of animal health guys cutting off balls and a bunch of vaccinologists and biochemists, but we saw the vaccine problem and we said, you know what, we're not neurologists, but we can probably solve that vaccine problem. So we started out in Alzheimer's and we thought, what are the properties that really would be necessary for a successful vaccine? Well, first, you got to get antibody response. And in the industry, it's like, let's overcome the immune barrier. So we want to make sure that, that people respond. We want to make sure that it's reversible. We also want to make sure that the antibodies that we generate target the toxic forms of the pathology. Um, we also want to make sure it's safe. That's, you know, run on. Um, and then today, we're also looking at hey, can they affect biomarkers? Can they affect cognition? And we've, we've done a phase one, it's very small. Uh, all the trends point, point well. And in fact, last, uh, last month, we actually just closed out our phase two trial. So, you know, this is just a, a quick recap. So we have a 100% response rate, whereas traditional vaccines have, you know, 40 or 50% on this stuff. Um, we're super safe. Uh, we've done, you know, 300 some doses, actually many more than that. Um, and now we're looking at, can we bring it from balls to brains? So if you ask anyone, do you want this amyloid plaque in their brain? They'll probably say no. So this is a scan, a PET scan, um, and the red stuff is the amyloid. And this is what an Alzheimer's brain looks like. And this is what we would like a brain to look like without this plaque. And you know, these scans are something that we want to show in our trial, and uh, it would be really cool if we could translate it from LHRH vaccine to the brains. And I'll just give you a, uh, a hint. These are not Google images, but we are still, you know, we haven't fully uh, looked at our data, so it's, I think my clinicians would kill me if I actually made a claim on it. But anyway, um, we're really excited about this. And so is it possible to have a vaccine revolution 2.0? Now, Daniel actually sent me an email and probably all the other speakers um, and said, you know, in your presentation, don't worry and don't be afraid to go out on a limb and predict the future and, uh, you know, share your vision of what's going to be like in five to ten years. So here's what I believe, hope, strive, aim to achieve in, in five to ten years with our vaccine platform. Um, and that's today we go to the doctor and we have our annual checkup and we get our cholesterol, our blood levels checked. And let's say your cholesterol is too high, they'll put you on a statin to prevent a heart attack 20 years down the line. What if you went to the doctor, you know, let's say 40, 45, and you got a brain number instead? And so if your brain number's too high, you know what, we're gonna give you a vaccine and keep your toxic proteins at bay. Now imagine if instead of going to a clinician, you know, a, a, a clinic, you could do it at a kiosk at a mall, or you could do it via your iPad at home. And imagine that instead of doing these, you know, once a year uh, tests, these could be monitored constantly. And so the stream of data would be, you know, through your watch, through Alexa or Siri, and you would be, you know, or you'd have um, these very affordable blood-based biomarkers at home or retinal scans, you know, from your iPhone or something like that. And then imagine that instead of going to an IV clinic or to the hospital to get your uh, infusions, you could get a shot at your neighborhood drugstore, or even if you're, you know, in a rural area, uh, via drone. So none of these technologies are out of reach. In fact, these are all available. Some of them are being deployed right now, and it's the convergence of these that's going to create the ecosystem along with the therapeutics that's going to change the way that medicine is going to be in 10 years.
And so I returned to the wisdom of children. And uh, as my son says, it's, it's really nice to be able to live by the values that you, you teach your kids. And so at United Neuroscience, um, we're working to democratize brain health. And that means that we want to deliver not just safe and effective treatments, but ones that are accessible to everyone. Um, we are starting our Parkinson's trial next year. Actually, uh, first quarter, we're going to start an anti-migraine trial at the end of the year. Um, because our, our philosophy is, you know, diseases don't discriminate. Alzheimer's doesn't care how much you make, where you live, uh, what you do for a living, and neither should medicine. So, thank you. Amazing work from Balls to Brains. <laughs> you mentioned um, other diseases, Parkinson's, et cetera. Yeah. So this, you see this as a platform play, right? Yeah. And what could the cost of this sort of be if we scale this in the next five, 10 to 10 years? Uh, so I mentioned the, the cost for animal health vaccines. So it's going to be an order of magnitude like that. So we're not quite sure, but uh, let's say order of magnitude, multiple orders of magnitude uh, less than the current biologics. And what kind of help do you need from this community to help make your vision happen and catalyze it? Demand accessibility for your drugs. Um, I think that if we hit that target and we say that target out loud, then people will begin developing solutions that are going to meet that. So we should be demanding that medicines are accessible to everyone. And uh, I think that's where innovation will come from. Right. Democratization. Yeah. Thank you, Mamie. Thank you. Awesome work.